Well, grace and peace to you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, goodness. Way, 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 way back in the day, <laughs> when I worked at North Heights Lutheran Church in St. Paul, I had a great mentor. His name is Bob Burmeister. I think we have a picture of him somewhere. I think then y'all click to it. There's Pastor Bob. Pastor Bob is like a guru of pastoral care. The man bleeds with compassion, but he's also got a great sense of humor. He's got tremendous wit. And what was interesting is when I was there on staff, and this was between 2004 and 2009, I think Pastor Bob had been on staff at North Heights for at least 30 years. He's still on staff there. After 54 years, I mean, amazing, right? After 54 years, the man is still in ministry. Isn't that something? I, th I think it is. And it, Pastor Bob was literally a mentor to me. I mean, and every week we would get together, at least for a couple years, and we would talk about this, that, pretty much anything, but also pastoral care. He would send me out onto assignments and have me go visit people in the hospital, then I'd come back and I'd report on, on, on my visit, this and that. But we would talk about other things too. We would talk about scripture. And, well, one day I was getting ready to go see Bob, and the night before I, I had this, I don't know if you would call it a dream. I, I really don't know. I was sleeping. And in my sleep, I saw and heard three words. I, it, it's all it was, was just three simple words. And it was go, do, and be. I saw the words printed and I saw and I heard them like a voice speaking to me. And then I woke. And I remember telling him about it that day as we were getting together. And I said, I got I, I to gotta tell you like what I heard last night, you know. And I said, I, I had the, like this dream where I heard go, do, and be. And Pastor Bob just looked at me and started to nod his head. And he goes, yeah, in the good Scandinavian, don't you know? For Pastor Bob, Wisconsin is the promised land. Anyway. And he said, but, yeah, that's right. But shouldn't it be, be, do? Then go. And I just kind of sat back and went, hmm. I knew enough not to argue with Pastor Bob. To quote William Shakespeare's Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question. To be or not to be Jesus' church is something I know full well Jesus implores us all to ponder and to do as the apostles in the early church did. And that all said, that brings us to our scriptural text today. We go back again to the book of Acts, this time to chapter 6, to the very first verses that the children heard today in, in their kids' Sunday school, verses 1 through 7. We heard verses 8 through 15 just moments ago in our in our first reading, but we're going to look at and read what was preceding Stephen standing up with so much power and grace and speaking the word of God. And this has to do with the call of Stephen. The English Standard Version of Acts chapter 6, verse 1, reads just like this. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The New Living Translation kind of puts a portion of that saying that there were rumblings and discontent. We all understand what that means, especially when it comes to service, right? When Danielle and I were younger. I don't remember how old we were. The only thing I remember is Haley was a little itty bitty toddler. And I don't remember where we were coming from, maybe Virginia Beach, 
I don't exactly remember. I just know that we were in the car, and I know Haley was with us, and we were going from the East Coast back to the Midwest. And we were stopping through Peoria, Illinois, to stay the night at Red Roof Inn. The towels, towels were paper, paper thin, by the way. But regardless, we, we went to a restaurant nearby called Cheddar's. Never heard of it, Cheddar's. Didn't know anything about Cheddar's, but it was right there across the parking lot. And we went. Food was pretty good. But what was even better was the service. We had this server that was like the best server I had ever experienced in my entire life. I remember that night I ordered chicken fried steak, which is one of my favorite dishes. And I resemble that remark. And I had a cup of iced tea with it. I never had to ask for a refill. This gal came by and she kept filling my glass. She would never get it let below half. She'd just keep coming by and filling the glass. And she just brought stuff, Johnny on the spot. And I remember after about an hour and a half, I, my bladder was about ready to bust, put it that way. Best service I'd ever, ever, ever had anywhere else, still to this day. You all know what good service is like, don't you? And on the flip side, I bet you know what really bad service is like too, don't we? We've all experienced bad service and probably had a little bit of discontent when we haven't had good servants. And not so good service is what was happening here in the book of Acts. The, the Greek-speaking believers, the Hellenists, right? They were discontent because their widows were being overlooked in the average daily food distribution. It was they, the early church had set up a food ministry, a food bank of sorts. And the apostles were leading the charge with that. And I'm sure it wasn't intentional that they, were over, that they were overlooking a certain group of people. It was just something that happened. And so a complaint arose. I guess you could say the apostles were probably burning their candles at, at both ends. They were trying to do it all. And, and things were falling through the cracks. And not just things, but unfortunately people. And people are far more important than things, wouldn't you agree? In their hearts, they wanted to serve as Jesus had served. We hear this in the Gospels, that Jesus came to serve and not to be served. We hear that out of the Gospel according to Matt and the Gospel according to Mark. It was something Jesus was known for. Jesus said specifically, I came to serve, not to be served. This, of course, follows a, a little section, a little pericope, a story ahead of it, a story that you've heard before, a story you probably know well. In the Gospel according to Mark, we hear the sons of thunder. We hear John and James, the sons of Zebedee. And they approach Jesus one day and they say, Jesus... When you're glorified in the kingdom of heaven, put us in the seats of honor, one at your right and one at your left hand. And Jesus is like, guys, you have no idea what you're asking for. And they're all like, yes, we do. And he's like, oh, no, you really do not. And he said, if you want to be first, you have to be last. And then he said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And to give my life as a ransom for the many. Let's admit it. As human beings, we love to be served. Wouldn't you agree? We all love to be served. Anybody ever go to like a really fancy schmancy like top tier Michelin star type restaurant, like the time where, kind of where you got to make a reservation for and put on your best duds and your best dress, the kind where you have more forks, more spoons, more knives, and you know what absolutely to do with, and you've got glasses surrounding your plate. Anybody ever been to one of them places? I've been to one. I didn't have to pay the bill, thank goodness. <laughs> it was on my employer. I Food in places like that is usually pretty top-notch. 
but so is the service. Restaurants like that pride themselves in spectacular service. They're not the only ones. We've got a lot of little kids here today. I know some of them have been to Walt Disney World. Disney is a fun place to go. And you know what's spectacular about Disney? It's not the movies that they produced, although the ones that came out when we were all little kids, like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. All those, those are great films. What's great about Disney isn't so much of their empire that they built, but the way they treat their guests. For them, service is king. They're all about making every single person that enters through their gates feel like a prince or a princess. That's their mission. It's not about the money. It's not about the product. It's about those who come through their gates. The same is true for every Michelin star rated restaurant, for every business that understands that their customers are king. It's all about an attitude of service. You know what's king for the king of kings? Is you and I having the same attitude as the king when it comes to serving other people, just as he did. But unfortunately, I think for our world, and especially for our country, I think too many Christians today have the attitude of John and James. They'd rather be served than to serve. And because of that, Jesus had to take them to task. And Jesus was telling his disciples, and now you and I, by extension, that he was on a mission to serve. And then if we want to follow after him, then we got to do just like him, that we have to serve as well and have the same attitude of service as him, right? That we have to be the church. We have to be. We have to be like Jesus to be servants of other people. The question I have for us is, are we making it our mission to serve as Jesus served? Or would we rather have somebody else do it? The early church decided to make it their mission to serve, to be and to do. Let's go back to Acts chapter 6. We're going to now pick up verses 2 through 7. And we hear this from the New Living Translation. So the 12 apostles, I put in parentheses, called a meeting, called a meeting of all the believers. So they had a church meeting, in other words. I wonder if they did a potluck too. And they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the Word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and full of the spirit of wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. I heard about Stephen earlier. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon. Parmenas and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert of the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. And then hear this last verse, verse 7. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests converted too. That last little bit is pretty spectacular in my opinion. It was all because of service, because the body was working together. There are a couple buddies of mine back in Toledo. I've talked about one of them a lot, Pooh Daddy. His real name is Heath Holland. The other is a gentleman by the name of Joe Sarns. Both Pooh and Joe worked in our tech booth at St. Paul's. Neither one of them are there anymore. They ran the tech booth. They were each at service from 8 in the morning until well past 11 every Sunday. They never 
ever missed a Sunday. Who would run sound? And Heath would run the system. It was just amazing what these guys did. They, they were always there without fail. And it wasn't just on Sundays. They were there on Wednesday nights for rehearsals and, and other times. I remember when we were looking for a new software system because we had to cut back on staff. We had, to, we had four too many. We couldn't afford everybody. And so we decided to have our booth team be completely volunteer-driven instead of staff-driven. And Joe stepped up to the plate. He said, I'll do that job that that paid staff person was doing. Now, Joe was a full-time teacher. And if you're a teacher, you understand what it means to be a teacher. It's not fun work. It's hard work. And Joe is a school teacher still to this day. But Joe took it on his mission to raise up and lead a volunteer team of 20 people to learn a brand new software system, to learn a new software system, to show other people how to use it, and every week from his house to put in the services as we do every single week. And then he was there not only to serve on Sundays, but to help serve and to help overseas. Joe probably put in 10 to 20 hours a week in service to the Lord. And that was in addition to other things that he did for the church. He and Pooh blow me out of the water. They amaze me at their hearts for the Lord. You know, all churches in America need a Joe. They need a Pooh. They need people like them. And we have people like them here at this church. I'm going to highlight one who's sitting in the back today. I'm going to put her picture right up there. This isn't even from us. This is the hospital recognizing Laura for her service. We deserve, she deserves a hand. But it's not just the hospital where she serves. It's at the nursing home, and it's here at the church. Every Friday, without fail, Laura shows up at 9 o'clock and goes down to the kitchen and picks up the kitchen. And she comes in here and she leaves. She picks up the sanctuary to all the bulletins and the snot rags and, and everything that we all leave behind. She picks them up. And then she folds bulletins. She makes cookies for the kids. She doesn't do it out of compulsion. She does it because she loves to do it. And we are grateful for Laura. I wish we had a thousand more Lauras in this congregation. I wish we had a million more Lauras in this world. A million more Joes, a million more Poos. The world could be a lot better. And we could learn something from people like Laura and Joe and Poo and others in our congregation. We need more people who bleed with the heart of service, right? Who would rather serve than be served. Because to be a servant of Jesus Christ, right? To be or not to be like Jesus, that is the question. Wouldn't you agree? We'll go back to verses 2 through 7. There's just a couple things I'd like to highlight. The first thing that we got to note is that the whole church agreed that, yeah, they all had to step up. They all needed to serve. Surely chose seven. These gentlemen, by the way, they weren't like waiting on tables as we kind of get the nuance in our English versions. It was more like they were administering or managing this gigantic food bank, this giant meal distribution. That's more of the nuance of, of what we get out of the Greek. It's not like they were serving tables like if we were to go over to Los Primos and, and order and have a server come by us. It's not, that's not the, the gist of what we're getting at here. They were managing, and other people would have had to step up and help too. But they were working together as a team, and the whole church decided, yeah, this is something good that we got to do so that no one would be left out of the distribution. Because for them, it wasn't necessarily the doing what was important. It was the whom. It was all about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came to serve and to die for our sins. And about those who Jesus came to save. They made it their mission to step up and serve with the heart of the Lord. And because they did, it freed up the apostles 
to teach, to preach, and to proselytize, to evangelize. It gave them time to do other things, but because it did, it just it opened up the door for other people to help out. The apostles realized that they needed help. They needed one another. We need one another. Cindy can't do it all. Laura can't do it all. I can't do it all. We need one another. We all need to serve. We've all been called to serve. Right? And we hear the result in verse 7. That the word of God continued to spread, that many people came to believe, and then even you hear this, and I think it's important that Luke put in this little tiny facet here. He said, and even some of the Jewish priests came to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus Christ in the way. And that's something. A group of people that had formerly rejected him were now seeing the church work together as a body, something Judaism didn't do well. But the church was coming together, and they were serving not only their big, large group, the gathering of believers, but they were serving the city and people who were in need. And that was attractive to the city and to onlookers. And the priests, the Jewish priests, saw that. They saw the body of Christ in action. And they wanted to be a part of that ministry. And the one who made it all happen, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It was a combination of the church working together. It was a win-win for the kingdom of God. When they made it king to serve the king of kings, with the same attitude of the king of kings, then the whole church on earth and the kingdom of God grew, and they grew exponentially. And that's something the church in the United States needs desperately right now. It's time for us to put aside our childish, and I'd say more so our selfish ways. It's time for everyone, everyone, to step up and do their part. You all have a gift. You all have skills. You have talents. You have passions. You can all serve one another, our body and our community, in powerful ways. We need to be the church, and we need to do the things that Jesus has called us to do so that we can get back to going into all the world to tell everyone how wonderful our Savior Jesus Christ is and what he came to do to save us all of our sins. The question I have for you as I wrap this up now in about 15 seconds is do you just want to continue on with the status quo? Or do you want to see the kingdom of God grow? Let's pray. Lord God, your word convicts. It reveals in us and to us how Jesus Christ came to save us. How he served us so beautifully passionately, even to give his life for us. May we learn that lesson and learn to serve the king of kings because serving him is king. Giving him our all in all is king. Help us to be about the king and serve with the heart and the attitude of the king. Help us make that our mission, Father God. To love you. To love one another. To not miss anyone. To love on our world. And show them what it means to be a child and a servant of the Most High King. And in the name of King of Kings, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.